such an important role, helping gather reports <laughs> from the weather spotters. So, John, take it away. Thanks, Todd. So, Todd mentioned the, you know, the radar and has mentioned how spotters are still very important into um, making a decision on how to warn storms. Really, in the Weather Service, this is uh, basically the way that you think about, you know, warning a storm. It's kind of a three different areas. You have the radar data, which uh, Todd talked about. You have the spotters out in the field actually giving you that ground truth. Uh, the third piece is the environment, actually looking at, you know, what the environment is in the storm, what is the atmosphere, you know, through all the different atmospheric readings that we take through computer modeling data. Those three pieces are really what uh, comes into making a decision. So that's the warning decision. And, you know, kind of the general rule of thumb that's been out there is a warning will usually go on two of these three. You know, that's obviously going to not always be the case, but to say as a general rule, it's usually, two, if you have at least two of the three, that's when you're going to take a look at um, warning a particular storm. Uh, warnings are a little bit different uh, than they have been over many years. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the warning product where it's, you know, severe thunderstorm warning for Hennepin County or, you know, tornado warning slash flood warning, whichever it is. And a few years ago, we actually started issuing warnings in uh, what we call it a polygon, but it's basically a storm-based warning. So it's based upon the direction of that storm and as, you know, you're moving along. It's not following, and this is a real good example, it's not following just the government, you know, <laughs> government boundaries. You know, storms don't follow the boundaries of the counties. They, they have a... They have a tendency, you know, to want to jump ship and you know get off of the roads a little bit. <laughs> so they don't, they don't, for whatever reason, listen to any of the arbitrary boundaries that we've put out there on a map for them. So you can see the direction of the count of the storm moving through, and this is how warnings are really issued: is by drawing out a, on a map where the storm is and where it's anticipated to be over the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes, half hour. Uh, however long the warning is in effect for. So that's one thing to really kind of take into account. And this is available online through the Weather Service website. You can go out and actually see the shapes. The shapes also draw out on the radar. There's various pieces of software available. But right on the Chan Hansen website, you can see the actual area being affected. You know, because now you can look, you know, this whole area is not being warned. Whereas by the old method, it'd be all of Chisago County, all of Anoka County, all of Ramsey County, just because of where that storm is at. So it lets us narrow it down a little bit more and working more and more with everybody out there to really understand that it's not just, you know, county boundaries anymore. So this is a big operational change, uh, kind of taking, shifting gears really into the amateur radio portion of it. Um, this is our map that we use for Chanhassen. These are all of the different organizations in our uh, county warning area, 52 counties um, that we cover. These are all the groups that we're in communication with via amateur radio. Um, as Mike mentioned in the introduction, we actually have our own uh, operator group that works out at Chanhassen. In the past, we used to borrow operators from Metro Skywarn, but in 2005, when Chan Hansen um, really redid how they talked to amateurs out in the field, um, and when I started out there in 2005, uh, we really changed the game as far as how we talked to uh, hams throughout the, throughout the entire area. Um, we work on a hub and spoke type of repeater system where we have just a few hubs out throughout the warning area that we are always listening to during severe weather. Because one of the chief things that we heard more and more as we talked to ham radio operators out in the field to say, I want to have a location where we're going to be able to get a hold of the weather service. You know, it got to the point where our capabilities significantly increased in the, in the early 2000s, but our operations didn't necessarily keep up with the equipment that we were adding. Uh, so we got more and more of a reach 
and still wanting to just operate as a, as a local organization. So that's where in 2005 we completely reorganized um, and got in touch with all these different organizations out throughout uh, Minnesota and western Wisconsin. Uh, you can see just from this, uh, we are also actively using Echolink to reach out to our uh, counties that are further out from the center here. Just, you know, you guys know you're, you're not going to make an RF trip out to Madison on a day. You know, you if you had maybe a boomer, you might make the trip on a clear day, but you put a storm in between the two and it's <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, so we are using Echolink to reach out to those areas and have really found uh, the connections to be fairly resilient. So that's something that's been a real positive note with us. Using the hub that lets us listen to each organization. Of course, we have um, Metro Skywarn, which has you know somewhat that concept. Where Metro Skywarn, all the hams here in the metro are reporting to you know the, whichever the main repeaters they happen to be using. You know, their primary repeaters are you know the 146.85 and the 147.21. But I know that the um, 76 is a backup that they have used um, in the past. So all those reports in the metro area come through Metro Skywarn, which then they communicate to us, you know, back back channel basically communication. And just like this system in the metro, we kind of use that elsewhere, where we have the Becker Paintsville system, which is actually our most um, heavy traffic system now in the whole uh, setup here, you can see the number of organizations that are communicating into that, where we actually run a closed repeater where Chanhassen and the net control stations from each of these uh, counties are the only people on the repeater. We're not taking direct reports to the weather service on that, so it works just like here in Metro Skywarn. You're talking to the Metro Skywarn net control operators they're pulling all the info together, making sure the report is good, you know, that it's, you have the location straight, you have what it is, and then they're forwarding that on to the weather service, um, kind of via, via back channel. So, big change here in 2005, and that's the way we operate today. Out of Chanhassen, we have a pretty significant radio setup uh, that's really come together here just in the last uh, few years. So this is just a shot that somebody took here at our recent Boy Scout Day. Uh, so this, you got the main uh, kind of getting your bearings from that picture that Todd showed you sooner. The, the radar site is actually kind of behind you or immediately to your left is where the radar tower is. And so we have our tower here that we've got all of our, all of our beams uh, set up on. So right outside the office here. Take a little zoom in on that. Uh, basically what we have set up for it is we have three and four element beams pointed at each of our hub repeaters. Um, so each of those has a beam dedicated right to them. Uh, then at the very top there you see we've got the, the big rotator that we can uh, point around to where we need to pick up something. You know, either there's a big storm in between us so we just need to boom into a repeater. Uh, we have that then hooked up um, to a amplifier with the radio so we can push, I believe it's 250 watts um, out so we can punch through quite a bit of stuff. But of course, you know, look at when are we operating? Well, it's when everybody else has stopped operating because they're not being able to do much on VHF. So that's when we're really needing to get through. So when there's, you know, lots of lightning static crashes and lots of um, rain that you're needing to get through. So. You know, we're, we're always at our peak operations at some of the worst operating conditions. So we have, that's why we've dedicated beams to each one of our hub repeaters. We also have a couple uh, verticals that we're using mostly for Metro. Um, that's what we talked with Metro Skyward on. We also have a, a dual band radio that we use for backup capabilities as well here for the Metro, the metro area. Uh, there's... Uh, myself and Jim Richardson, one of the lead forecasters out of Chanhassen, WM0X, if you've heard the call on the air. Um, this is us sitting at the, the radio desk, um, just the call out. So we've got our full, you know, kind of queue of radios here. Um, our computer with the radar, and you'll see more of that. But the really important thing with our operations out here is you see our back is right to the forecasters. We're right across the desk from the warning forecasters. 
So the people actually issuing the tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings. So the reports coming in from the field are absolutely critical, and they very quickly get turned around to be used in warning products. Because as Todd said, you know, and research has shown, and even evidence that we've seen on damage surveys is that people just react more quickly, and they react with more conviction if you can say someone has seen a tornado or someone has seen three-inch hail out of the storm. People just react more truthfully to that. So as much as we can, we get those reports in, turn them right around to the warning forecasters that, are, that we're working hand-in-hand -in, -hand in during the severe weather operations. Not cooperating. There we go. I need to be right next to it. Uh, so that's a look. Just another look at the operations. So you sit there. We've got our full rack of rack of radios here with all the the amps, the power supplies underneath the computer where we've got the radar up, and then we also have um, what we call a situation awareness screen, which is basically what happens is there. Let's see. There's four of these, five of these up around the operations area. And we can swap out any of the sources for video that we need to up there. So you can see the radar, you can see the environment. We can look at Google Earth to see where are their spotters out there. If they're using spotter network. Uh, several different pieces that we can pull up to have available to us during a severe weather event. If storm chasers are out there actually streaming tornado video, we can actually put that up so you can actually see what the spotter or what the storm chaser is seeing out there. So a lot of different pieces to do. Um, during severe weather events out at MPX, we always have, uh, we, we really shoot for having three to four operators no matter what. So any kind of an event, we usually have three to four people out there. And that's where we have three people at the radio and one person sitting behind them as an event coordinator over the communication side. So we work you know, pretty hard at making sure we have good, consistent communications out to all the net control operators and kind of the event coordinator under the communications or ham radio side works hand in hand with um, the coordinator on the, you know, meteorological or the warning side of the operation. Uh, so again, you know, just kind of look at the operations, you know, we've got all the maps up. The one thing that we also added this year is we do have an 800 megahertz radio um, armor system. So we are in communications with the, the cities and counties here in the metro area that have the 800 megahertz system rolled out. So we do talk to them. And this year was the first year that we really were, in, you know, communicating with them using that system. And I think that use is just going to keep growing as the system expands outside of the metro area here over the next couple of years. Uh, just to look again at the system, you know, everything um, brought up here, you know, we have access to all the same, the radar products, we have a copy of GR Level 3, which is a radar software where you can plot the locations of people, um, chasers and spotters on top of the radar. We, you know, we'll pull up streaming video if it's necessary out in the field so that we can see what's going on, um, along with actually doing the ham radio operations. Um, you can see multiple radio decks and everybody really um, talking, you know, a lot of ham radio. 